I'm actually not the author of this book I'm going to be talking about today. I'm the author of a couple of chapters in it. And I'll explain all that as I go through it. But I wanted first to introduce the, the, this, the gender panel that has actually uh, worked together to come up with the paper that, that I'm talking about today. And some of you may know Rebecca Darrow Minarchik, who's a graduate student here in Development Soch. And these other people, Malcolm Cairns is the actual editor of the book I'll be talking about. And these other people are the, are the members of the panel. And so we kind of put this all together in a collaborative sort of way. Um, the outline of what I'll be talking about, I'll start with a little background explaining about the book first. Um, introduce you very briefly to a gender framework that I came up with uh, about a year ago. Explain what we mean by Swidens. And then mainly I'll be talking about the five topics that came up in the course of the, um, of the parts of this book that, that we looked at. And then I'll conclude with some maybe predictable remarks for myself. Um, the book is, it is edited by Malcolm Cairns, and it's now called Shifting Cultivation and Environmental Change, Indigenous People, Agriculture, and Forest Conservation. Is that not sounding quite right? Um, it used to have a nice title called A Growing Fo Forest of Voices, but the publisher made him change it. Um, it's a kind of a follow-on document or, or uh, volume to one called Voices from the Forest, which was published in 2007. And it has over 100 chapters. I don't know exactly how many. It might be as much as 150. I can't imagine the publisher's going to agree to that, but uh, we're st <laughs> they're still collecting them. Um, the, the authors are just a huge disciplinary uh, variety. There's, there's people from every discipline I can imagine could possibly have anything to say about shifting cultivation. I had a lot of fun doing this because I worked in shifting cultivation systems a number of years back, and then I had a period where I didn't focus on that at all. And then Malcolm asked me to do this gender thing, and I was way over committed and I didn't have time, but I, I was too tempted and I had to do it. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to, to kind of get an update on what's happening in, in Sweden and Southeast Asia. So the, this gender box, this um, conceptual framework that I worked on about a year ago, uh, we decided to kind of use that as a little bit of an organizing framework and also as a way of testing it to see if the, in this new body or this new corpus of material, if we actually had some of the, it, the issues that I thought were important based on a general review of the literature. In that review, I identified 11 topics that I thought were important and there were th three scales, you know, from micro, meso, and, and macro. And it, that gender box is available on, online if anybody's interested in it. Here's a picture of it. Um, the, the 11 issues are portrayed in the dark green, and the scales are uh, micro, meso, and macro. But as you can see, I, my dealing with time dimension is a little bit minimal. And um, I felt that this was another sort of a failing of the, of the conceptual framework. And so we decided that we would try to, to fine tune that a little bit in, in the course of looking at these new materials. And so we tried to do that. I'll come back to the gender box at the end. Um, so what do we mean by Sweden? For some people, Sweden is a pretty alien word, uh, but it's the same thing basically as shifting cultivation or slash and burn. Um, the way we've used it, the way we've defined it, is basically a system where the forest is cut and food crops are planted for a shorter period than the, the area is left in fallow. And sometimes it's done in grasslands, but in Southeast Asia more often it's, it's forest. Um, most of the systems that we looked at were rice-based. There were a few root-based, but mostly rice. Uh, many of them were complex and ecologically sound sorts of systems. Not all, of course, but a number of them. Um, and many of them were very intimately connected with people's ways of life. So there were important uh, cultural connections between people and this way of, of making a living. Um, and, we, and just as was the case uh, several decades ago when I started looking at shifting cultivation, the systems continue to be maligned whether they're sustainable or not. Um, in, in the corpus of material that we looked at, I was able to, or we were able to, divide what we found into five major topics. And I've tried to organize these in terms of the speed of change. Again, we're trying to get the time dimension a little clearer. And it seemed to us that perceptions and symbolism was something that changes quite slowly and that population concerns might be something that would change pretty quickly. This is you know, not any kind of anything written in stone. It's a, maybe it seemed to us to be a general tendency. 
Um, but I'll go through each of these five topics one by one. Um, perceptions and symbolism, there were a number of things that fit into this category. The first one is this question of cognitive gender differences. People see men and women as, as different. In the West, in many of the studies that I've looked at, men and women are perceived as sort of diametrically opposed. It's like black and white, male, female. In Southeast Asia, very often they are seen as very close. Both human beings, um, not, very, not terribly differentiated. We also looked at gender ideals. That popped up a lot. Um, in a lot of the literature on gender relating to men, uh, the idea of hegemonic masculinity is, is emphasized, and that's the idea that men are, should be powerful, in control, uh, good supporters of the family, and, and able to boss around their wives, for instance. Um, now, this is in some places in, in Southeast Asia that this occurs, but in a lot of places it's not very emphasized. It's not a, as strong a, an ideal as in many parts of the world. Women are often seen, and ideally, as hard workers at rice cultivation. This question of nurture was another one that's interesting. In the West, we tend to see nurture as something that's pretty feminine. Women are the, supposed to be the nurturing people. But so, a number of authors have argued that in Southeast Asia, it's seen as kind of a pan-human uh, tendency, that men and women are supposed to be nurturing. Everybody's supposed to be nurturing. I still think that there's a little bit more of a tendency for women to have to be nurturing than men, even in Southeast Asia, but it's much more by, by gender um, than, um, than for us. Um, another thing that we thought was interesting was in many parts of Southeast Asia, you have some kind of dominant ethnic group, like in Indonesia, the Javanese tend to be a dominant ethnic group. The Dayaks tend to be a marginalized ethnic group. And you have that kind of relationship between ethnic groups in a lot of places in Southeast Asia. And in this relationship, very often women's behavior is taken as some kind of in-depth indicator of depravity. For instance, the Dayak women are seen as promiscuous, and this shows that these people are primitive and backward and whatnot. And you find that in a number of, of locations in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And then the last one I wanted to mention about perceptions and symbolism is the symbolic uh, perceptions of relations between women and rice. Women's fertility is often made into an analogy with the growth, growth of rice um, in the fields. And there's all kinds of beliefs about that. Um, and often women have important uh, cere ceremonial roles related to rice. OK, the second topic is the division of labor. And there was more on that. Um, uh, Women are commonly in this part of the world involved in rice cultivation, and in one of the one of the cases, there were they did as much as 75 percent of the work. Um, it's often more evenly distributed, but women are almost always very active. Um, they're also involved in non-timber forest product collection in many of these places. There's a tendency for for men to fell and women to weed. That's a pretty pretty consistent uh, tendency in most places. For the men make the holes in the ground and women put in the, the seeds or, or everybody puts in the seeds in a lot of places. Um, and in many places, the, the uh, gender relations are not very rigid. So it, it's, this isn't, a, again, not in concrete, but it's a tendency. There's also a tendency for men to do fallow crops. And a lot of these tree crops that are becoming quite popular in Southeast Asia are um, in the fallow, in what used to be the, the rice fields fallows. And men are also likely to be involved in those crops that require a lot of physical strength. Women are almost always involved in food collection, although men may be as well. But uh, at least women are involved in that. And they can be involved in these other things, too. Again, like I said, it can be quite flexible. We wondered, as we were looking at these materials, if maybe the generally adverse attitude toward shifting cultivation may have something to do with the fact that it's so closely associated with women. And women's behavior is very often um, considered of lower status than men's in, in the world. Um, this is just a thought we had, but I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's right. Um, another thing that we thought was interesting was that when you look at women's daily lives, they're very typically involved in the process of production all the way through to consumption, and as opposed to men are often mostly involved in the production realm. 
Um, and they're also often involved in, in uh, from, from production to the nurturing sort of elements of life. Um, more, again, more than men, even though, as I said earlier, there's a tendency for men and women to be seen as nurturing. It, the number of cases showed that as the agricultural system was changing, there were changes in the domestic cycle. So um, in a situation, for instance, where men and women had both, young men and women had been the ones who did the weeding, some places that happened, then when the men got drawn away to, for wage labor, the middle-aged women might be left uh, doing the weeding. So it would be a, a real change in the, in the division of labor. And that kind of thing has happened a lot, as well as this solidifying of roles. So in a lot of places, as I mentioned before, it was flexible before and it's now more rigid. This second to last one, reduced fallows means more weeding. This is something that really has impressed most of the biophysical scientists in the group that, are, that have written about these systems. Um, first of all, as the, as the fallows reduce in, in length, the weeding problems increase and production is likely to go down. But the we increase in weeding is very likely to mean a real problem for women's, women's labor. And everybody seemed to be worried about that. And lastly, as labor changes, the indigenous knowledge is being lost. Part of that has to do with the fact that people aren't doing the work and so the, the particular type part of the labor, uh, so they lose the ability to do it. But part of it also has to do with education and the pulling away of children to go to school and then they're not learning the important uh, knowledge about, about shifting cultivation or about agriculture. Um, the third topic is this question of tenure and access. And there is a huge variation in, in uh, women's and men's respective access to, to forest and land. Uh, it has to do with lineality, that is, some places are patrilineal, some places matrilineal, some places bilateral. So you have kinship systems that vary and have differing in implications for women's access. It's not always the case that a matrilineal group means that women have a lot of access, but they tend to have easier access and more secure rights in, in such systems. Residence is another important issue. Some places the man goes and lives with the woman or, or with her family, and in those cases women tend to have easier access to land. Um, and then the question, this question of macro-micro interactions, I'm thinking here of the government's role. Uh, very often governments come in and they give, they encourage the private property and the titling of lands and they tend to give those titles to the male head of household which, and I considered these to be worrying trends, this uh, giving of titles to men. Uh, uh, sometimes they also give them to women head of, heads of household, but usually it's men. And then also a reduction in open access and common property areas, where women have many places in the world. Women have ha had those common property places as their areas of access. Um, uh, yeah. There are some moderating trends in, in, this, in these worrying trends. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, fe female heads of households can, be, can uh, be given land. Sometimes the husbands are away, as I mentioned earlier, doing wage labor. And although that means a problem for women in the sense that there's more labor that they have to do, they also very often have stronger voices in local decision making. And so that is a positive, or can be a positive. Uh, in a number of these, of these systems, the youngest person, the youngest sibling would stay and take care of the, of the old parents. And if that's a woman, then she very often has a very strong voice as the parents get older and, and are no longer able to be involved in the uh, actual work. Which brings to the last point there, the sweat equity issue. Um, it, it most, in general, except maybe in the Middle East, in most countries, and places, if you do the work, you tend to have a little stronger voice than you would otherwise. And so the women are doing a lot of the work in, in uh, shifting cultivation or in Sweden agriculture. And so that does give them something of a stronger voice. Um, okay, this one, gender differential access to technology markets and cash was also something, a lot of changes are going on in this, in regard to this issue. Uh, in this region, 
and the, the different authors, there were a lot of authors who were quite interested in this topic. Um, it seems pretty consistent, as has been noted for decades, that men tend to get technology first, um, and women are continuing to have to do a lot of the drudgery, with weeding being the prime example. Um, one of the cultural issues that, that seemed important to me, having worked a long time in some of these systems, is this change. As cash comes in, uh, it sort of functions to reduce the value on sharing. A lot of the sharing that people, sometimes in a lot of these systems, it's extremely strong, it's an extremely strong value. I thought I was generous until I went to live with Diax, and then I realized how incredibly selfish I really am. <laughs> Because if you have an abundance of anything, you are expected to share it. And it's really a no-no if you don't. And, uh, but that's changing because, you know, one of the, a sort of functionalist reason for that to be the case is that the things that you have in abundance are going to get rotten anyway. And so you might as well share them. But that's not the case with cash. You know, cash is, uh, it, it functions a little differently than some of these primary products. Um, so that's a pro I, think I see that as a problem because I really valued that, that incredible emphasis on sharing myself, even though I made, my, made me feel selfish. Um, mo modern markets are having varying in effects, usually to men's advantage. Um, there were a couple of cases where, for instance, in Laos, there's a, an example where the women ha have been weaving absolutely beautiful pieces of cloth. And those are very attractive to tourists. And so they're making money from that. Um, and, it, and the men are accepting that in that particular place. But more often, it's the other way around, that the men have the, the access to, um, to markets. They, uh, often, the, the kinds of things you can do in a forest context require a great strength. They may also require the ability to move around. And women's, women are often constrained in their geographical mobility because of children or beca also because of norms, um, what women are supposed to do. Um, but anyway, so men have a little bit of advantage that way, too. Um, and then this introduction of tree plantations. A lot of countries in that region, of, of uh, governments in that region, are trying to encourage uh, the growing of tree crops. And uh, tree, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, that's a good idea. I mean, tree crops have been sort of part of shifting cultivations for a long time. Um, but they're doing it a little differently now. They're making uh, uh, agreements with industry. And then industry is coming in and trying to plant rubber over the whole, you know, hundreds of thousands of hectares. And the same is true with oil palm and uh, various other tree crops. So that has, that kind of process is very different from the traditional manner in which people have incorporated tree crops. Um, it, it, the incorporation of tree crops in the past has been uh, um, a way of, of addressing changes in prices and also a, um, moderating risk. Because if, if one thing didn't work, the other ones might. Um, but the way it's being done now, it's, it's making pressure on the land so that there's less land available and reducing then the lengths of fallows with more weeds, <laughs> as we've already discussed. Um, access to wage labor is disproportionately available to men, which has been the implication of some of the other things I've said. And the resulting labor shortages have meant that women have had to fill the gap a number of people are really concerned about the impacts that may have on nurture, on childcare, on um, uh, some of the non-productive activities that women are involved in. And this is one of the things I've felt we really need to pay more attention to because there's been so much pressure for us who work on gender issues to prove that women are actually involved in um, productive activity that we have sort of neglected the fact that those other activities that women have been involved in are absolutely crucial for the maintenance of, the, of humanity. You know, babies have to be taken care of. It takes time. And so I think that's something that we haven't maybe paid enough attention to ourselves. And, and it's a problem in this case. And then the last one I wanted to mention was these new dangers. First of all, there's a, a danger that the somewhat equitable systems that are that characterize Southeast Asia can be skewed and made more inequitable by these differences in wage uh, opportunities. And prostitution and AIDS have both come into a lot of these areas and uh, caused other problems. Population changes. Um, 
in, in 2007, I went, was invited to a meeting called The Demise of Shifting Cultivation. And when I heard that title, I just laughed because I had my job at C4 involved traveling to Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And I saw shifting cultivation everywhere I went. So I found this very peculiar. But it turns out that we, we later decided to change the name of it to the transformation of shifting cultivation because it is actually being transformed partly because people are doing more and more of these, inco incorporating tree crops more and more meaningfully into their work. Um, but there's huge variation also in the simple population increase or, or not, um, depending on where you are. Um, in many places that are sparsely populated, you still have problems with land availability. And that's beca partly because of this intrusion, or I call it intrusion, <laughs> the, the uh, investment of uh, large scale um, land, uh, things like transmigration or plantation, large scale plantations or, um, um, and also the, the anti-Swidden campaigns, which are very serious in a lot of the mainland Southeast Asia areas. Um, and then demographically speaking, there's this shortage of male labor. Part of it has to do with education. Now, and in many places, the women are also being educated, which is a difference from between Southeast Asia and many parts of the world. Um, but it's a serious one in this region as well. And in some places, you have only the very old and the very young remaining in the villages. We found that in a lot of places, birth control is quite popular among the women. They want to work in rice fields. They want to get an education. They want to be paid. Um, at, in the community that I worked in in East Kalimantan in 79, 80, at that time, I brought, I made birth control available. I, I, and when I left, I trained two local women to take over what I had been doing. And of all the different things I did to try to work with lo local people and do development or conservation or something of that sort, that's the one that has been continual, continued and still continues, never stopped. So, but I mean, that's one community, but there were other places also that, that where the women were quite enthusiastic about it. And the infant mortality rates are going down in many of these places. The, the not all, the one that's most obvious is in cases of resettlement, where um, you, people are resettled and put in rather bad situations. All right. So those are the things we, that we, 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 when we read all those papers, we just tried to pull out whatever we could find about gender, and then we categorized it in, in those ways. Uh, but then we went back and looked at the gender box to see if, okay, did that, does this corpus include those, those 11 topics that we had included, that I had included in the gender box? And indeed it did, which was reassuring. <laughs> Um, and then we tried to fine tune the, the time dimension. And we were able to fine tune it a little bit. I'm still not completely satisfied with what we've done, but I'll just show you what we did. I don't know if you can, yeah, there we go. Human life cycle, this has to do with uh, people's age, that there are changes in people's behavior related to their age, and that probably ought to be paid more attention to. Um, the de developmental cycle of domestic groups as, um, People have families, and as families evolve over time, when people are young and uh, they're first married, there may only be two people. And then gradually, as, as they, their uh, domestic situation evolves, they get more children. And then eventually, they may have a large household with old people. And then maybe the old, pe or the old people may be all alone again. So then you're going to have two. So these sort of changes in the household have important implications for labor availability and a lot of other um, things that may be important for, um, for biophysical scientists. I, I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning that I actually developed this gender box for use by biophysical scientists because they've been at C4, they've been struggling with how they want to address gender, but they have no idea how. And so I've tried to identify some of the things that are important to look at. And so that would be one, another one that would be important to look at. And then the last one is this social cultural change. Um, but it seems to me there ought to be something sort of in here in between, but I haven't come up with it yet. And it didn't come out in the materials that we were looking at. Um, I want to mention one thing about this gender box, and that is that it's really intended as a kind of three-dimensional matrix. So I think that any one of those topics, say domestic roles, here it is right there, that one. Now that could be looked at 
at, from a micro scale, you know, you could be looking at it in a community, a meso scale, what are the impacts sort of at the district level, and at a macro scale, what, how, what does it mean in, a, in an international context? So all of these, I think, could be looked at at any scale, but they're organized this way because we thought the regulations and informal norms most typically would be looked at at the macro scale. These, these in here would most typically be looked at at the meso scale, and these would be most likely to be looked at at the micro scale. But you could look at any of them at any scale, I believe. And then the same with this, with these time dimension. I think you could probably cross that with any one of these other uh, topics if you wanted. So uh, just a couple more slides to go through. One of them is we tried to figure out what we thought still needed to be done and we felt that there's a tendency to not look at things holistically and we think that it would be very valuable if um, uh, scientific, biophysical type scientific research could be looking more holistically. And uh, we think that's especially important for looking at gender. Um, there's a lot of people looking at the productive system and there actually are quite a few people also looking at the consumption or the domestic and reproductive sorts of systems, but the two don't talk to each other very much. And we feel that in women's lives, these are very closely linked and um, that it would be helpful if we could come up with some way to look at the whole uh, rel range of, of, uh, of systems. Um, and then the last one, we still, like I mentioned before, I don't think the time dimension has really been completely adequately addressed yet. So if anybody has any suggestions, we're still working on this. Um, and then I will finish with a, last, a few last words. And for the, anybody who knows me, this is a very predictable thing for me to say. <laughs> but I think that we, I'm sort of a bottom up -y sort of person. And so I think we're trying to activate the Swidner's potential and work with them and use their knowledge in a useful way. So I think we need to increase the amount of action research we do. Um, I think every place is genuinely different, every, both from a biophysical point of view and from a social point of view, and I think we need to be taking that into account. These, as uh, Rebecca said the other day, Rebecca Nelson, we can't, these blanket rules about what ought to be done just don't work, and so I think we need to recognize that. And then I think part of that is gonna have to be collaborating with communities to figure out what they need to have done, what they want to have done, and what sorts of things they themselves can do to make that happen, um, probably including some monitoring. Um, I think another part of this is, is an attitudinal thing with scientists. Um, many times, I think scientists are trained to be the one who knows. You know, you learn about these things and you have this body of knowledge and you go out and you want to use it. But I think to do that effectively, we really need to have a much more modest notion about how our knowledge can be used because it it's going to have diff it's going to be different in different places both from a human point of view and from a biophysical point of view and so i think we need to be more willing to acknowledge error and to um, uh, maybe monitor and see what happens sort of have that kind of attitude when you're working with communities so we can learn from our failures and then uh, this i would just conclude with I think these these ideas on this slide are even more true of working with women than men because women are they really are harder to get at than men first of all a lot of scientists are men so that makes one barrier women often don't know the national language which makes another barrier they may be illiterate they may not be free to move around as as men have been um, and they may be overwhelmed already with work and so there's a lot of things that that suggests that we really are going to have to pay a little more attention, work a little more intensively with women than we have with men. Um, and then I also think that, that it's more true of subsistence than commercial systems because subsistence, subsistence systems don't have a convenient measurement like dollars um, that, that uh, commercial systems have. So I think that's all I was going to say. Yeah, so thank you and um, any questions?